I'm not going to become Mother Teresa in a 72 hour binge of Bible reading, but I can do better. And that sanctification issue uh, needs to be applied to environmental concern as well. Start small and start rolling. And the first issue would be to shift your posture. And I would encourage everyone within the sound of my voice, get informed and get informed in your biblical theological response, because there are a thousand voices out there. And let's make sure that we're listening to our Bibles, not just to whoever the activist is that jumps on the radio this week. Welcome to Great Bible Teacher Interviews. I'm Rick Jordan, president of Great Bible Teachers. And each week I have the opportunity to interview a Bible scholar, an author, or a practitioner. We talk about the Bible, or both biblical interpretation or spiritual practices and spiritual formation. This week, I'm very pleased to have the interview with Sandra Richter. Dr. Richter is the chairman of the Bible department at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. She has her BS from Valley Forge University, her MA from, Garden, from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and her PhD from Harvard. I became acquainted with Dr. Richter through her book published by InterVarsity Press called Stewards of Eden, What Scripture Says About the Environment and Why It Matters, published in 2020. What surprised me is that she is solidly in the evangelical camp and she is solidly in the environmentalistic camp wanting to take care of our creation. And those oftentimes do not go together. So I was very intrigued with her book and convicted by it as well. And then uh, saw her as somewhat uh, having a rare perspective, being a theologian with expertise in the book of Deuteronomy, and then how she uses that to help Christians understand how we should be involved in the care of our creation that God has given us. So I hope you'll enjoy this interview with Sandy Richter. <clears throat> there is a reason that nearly every hospital and every orphanage and every welfare organization on this planet has the word cross or Christian or salvation or saint uh, in the title. So we're good at the widow and the orphan, and we recognize right along with James that this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father, to care for orphans and widows in their difficulties and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Um, I think we can commend especially the evangelical wing of the church for this sort of sacrifice and investment. But as I said earlier in our interview, one of the things we don't see and we don't understand is that our treatment of the environment deeply impacts the widow and the orphan. And so if we go to some of the corners of our own country, uh, and certainly if we move internationally, we will see for ourselves the widow and the orphan being wiped out by environmental irresponsibility. And a major issue in, is uh, the issue of mountaintop removal coal mining. And uh, people don't like to talk about it because it has to do with economy and, you know, good old capitalism, which is the one religion we're not allowed to challenge in uh, this country of ours. And uh, because it's local and there are actually people involved. But if you, if your folk would go on uh, any of the websites and just type in mountaintop removal or MTRVF or Appalachian voices, um, they would get to see for themselves the fact that the poorest of the poor, uh, their lives are being crippled by this economic pursuit. Uh, they are literally being poisoned. Their homelands are being bombed by legal detonations. Their economic capacity is being crippled. Their children are uh, going to school in elementary schools that are five, six, seven miles from impoundment uh, lakes, which are toxic sludge retainment ponds, that uh, the big Sandy River was a victim of a collapse in 2000. Um, these are horrific conditions. 
but we turn a blind eye to them because we need the money. We need the money. Hmm. Um, the Ganges River system in India is a classic example. We Americans exported an array of industries because they were too environmentally costly. Uh, leather working is one. They're, they're an array of factory uh, productions that <clears throat> we as Americans decided were too impactful on our environment and on our children, and we were right. Uh, so we exported them. And so India and China picked them up. And the Ganges River system in India is now to the point where the United Nations has named it, well, um, tentatively named it a dead system, a dead system, the Ganges River Basin. That would be like someone announcing that the Mississippi River is dead. Every tributary, every creek, every stream, dead. And all of the soil attached to it, toxic. Back when I first did my research uh, on the Ganges River, which is five, seven years old now, uh, the United Nations statistics were that the leading, leading cause of death in India for a child under the age of five was contact with the sacred river, the Ganges, leading cause of death. China right now, there's a reason these people know how to wear masks because lung cancer is so rampant. Again, United Nations statistics, I'm not pulling this off an activist website, that the environmental impact of China globally is unprecedented. And largely that's because we've exported our industries to these countries. Um, so in the chapter, I talk through several of the environmental missionaries that I support and that I know and love. Uh, two of them are Neil and Danielle Karlstrom, who spent a chunk of their lives with the Malagasy people in Madagascar. And Madagascar, this incredibly unique red island that has more uh, unique species than any other corner on the planet, 88% deforested. Why? Um, big business, the almighty dollar. And of course, when these very unique faunal systems collapse, then the waterways collapse. And when the waterways collapse, fishing collapses. And guess what the Malagasy people do to feed their children? They fish. And when the river systems collapse and the um, banks are uh, denuded, then the soil washes away. And so the uh, subsistence farmers can no longer support themselves. And when the farms collapse and the fishing collapses, then the families start collapsing. And the rise in domestic violence skyrockets and the unemployment and the addiction skyrockets. And you wind up with the widow and the orphan, once again, unable to sustain themselves, beaten and abused and abandoned by the men in their lives, and an economic system that can no longer support human life. And so Danielle and Neil went to Madagascar as missionaries in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Amazing people. I'd love to get to interview them um, with you. Uh, young, in their 20s, with three beautiful little babies. And Neil went as a botanist. So in the name of Jesus, he's teaching the locals to plant indigenous trees in their backyard gardens so that they can sell them to the United Nations and to the Peace Corps, which gets money back in their pockets. And Danielle went as a midwife because due to the collapse of their indigenous industries because of environmental abuse, Madagascar had gotten to the place where one out of every 10 women died in childbirth. So let's pause and think about that for a moment. How many babies are under your roof? How many babies are under your friend's roof? How many babies are in the church nursery? One out of 10 women dying, trying to produce a human because of environmental collapse. We don't see this stuff, but we the church, we need to stand up and speak. And honestly, I believe with every fiber of my being that the next wave of missions is not gonna be hospitals and orphanages. It's going to be environmental restoration. And I already know dozens of people who are involved in it. In the name of Jesus, helping these people to get their, their countries back so they can support their people 
and they can feed their babies. So, sorry, I digress. Yeah. No, that's great because you know, part, of the, part of the reality is that, you know, reading your book or reading from, from some of these other sites, um, you, you have some suggestions of some places uh, to get more information, but it can be overwhelming. It's like, okay, the Bible says, take care of God's good earth. We haven't been, but there's so much energy and force and money and um, everything that is involved uh, with destroying God's good earth. Uh, not intentionally always, but, but even so, it's what's, what's happening that it can be overwhelming. And so you're giving, giving us a word of hope, like this couple uh, who, are, who are doing something. Can you, um, what gives you hope uh, for what the individual can do? Like what, I know at the back of your book, you do have a chapter that has uh, probably about 20 different things that someone can do. Um, you know, what, what would be some suggestions you would say for just the average lay person who's not, um, you know, they're not a scientist, they're not a midwife, maybe they're not, but, they, but there are things that they can do as a spiritual discipline, even, if you will, to, to say, I'm going to be a steward of God's kingdom on earth. I, I love the fact that you named it a spiritual discipline. Because typically what happens when I speak on this topic is people respond and they respond beautifully. And, uh, you know, it's altar call time. What do we do? You've, you've warmed our hearts. You've touched our conscience. We haven't seen our sin before. We see it now. What do we do? And like you said, it feels overwhelming. And, and people often are paralyzed because it's so overwhelming. So let me speak first to the topic of, yeah, it is overwhelming. And yeah, what can I as one person do? And honestly, we the church have struggled with that for millennia. We also look at the count of orphans on this planet and refugees on this planet and trafficked women and the impoverished and um, the political agonies of places like Somalia and um, what's happening in certain other states of Africa. And we are overwhelmed, right? But even though we're overwhelmed, that doesn't stop us from taking action. And what we do is we kind of regroup and we pull ourselves back and we say, I can do something. Even if I can't fix it, I can do something. And, and that really is our posture as Christians. That's what sanctification is all about. I am not going to become Billy Graham in a week. I'm not going to become Mother Teresa in a 72-hour binge of Bible reading, but I can do better. And that sanctification issue uh, needs to be applied to environmental concern as well. Start small and start rolling. And the first issue would be to shift your posture. And I would encourage everyone within the sound of my voice, get informed and get informed in your biblical theological response, because there are a thousand voices out there. And let's make sure that we're listening to our Bibles, not just to whoever the activist is that jumps on the radio this week. And with that shift of posture, okay, what do we do? And you're right, I do have a chapter at the end, which is entitled um, Resources for the Responsive Christian. And, and that's exactly how I think about it. Okay, I'm a Christian, I'm listening, I want to respond how do I respond? And the first thing I ask people to do is get informed, right? So um, get either my book or Doug Moo's book or somebody's book and get yourself in, uh, informed on a biblical uh, posture regarding this and then get informed on the problem. And one of the first things you can do is get a subscription to one of the reputable environmental magazines. So I would recommend Sierra Club. I'd recommend Nature Conservancy. Even Audubon is good. Um, <clears throat> a little more uh, politically tamped down, but still uh, a very good magazine. National Geographic is a darn good magazine on these topics. And what that does is it, it forces you to put a little bit of money where your mouth is. So that buying of subscription helps these people keep informed 
um, or keep producing their material. And as the magazine comes into your home, or if you're a, a streamer, you know, an internet person, your subscription there, it starts moving you into the information. So you get to see the bigger picture. Um, another thing that needs to happen is we have to start, as always, voting our informed conscience. We talked about this at the beginning of the podcast. Uh, every time I go to vote, I am so stressed out because I am a pro-life patriot environmentalist. So who the heck do I vote for? And honestly, I find myself much more satisfied voting on the local level than I do on the national level. But get informed, vote your informed conference, uh, conscience. One of the things I really appreciate about Sierra Club is every year about this time, they publish an issue that actually details how your representatives in your state have been voting on the environmental question. Have they, they've been selling out to big business and the oil industry, or are they actually um, asking these big companies to put their money where our conscience is and to do better. I don't always vote what Sierra Club tells me to, but it helps me to be informed. And then in my house, um, spiritual disciplines, right? So every time I buy an appliance, I'm checking its energy record. Uh, every time I put in a plant in my yard, uh, gardeners out there, I'm asking the question, is this a native plant? And if it's a native plant, it will thrive in my conditions. If it thrives in my conditions, I'm not gonna have to be spraying it down with pesticides every week. I'm not gonna have to be ramping it up with artificial fertilizers. I'm not gonna have to uh, set my entire irrigation system around that plant's survival. On top of that, when native plants are in my yard, my yard becomes a little garden of Eden for the local flora and fauna. Uh, here we've moved to Southern California. I'm an East Coast girl. I don't, I don't get this stuff. And so I've had to put all sorts of energy into getting informed on my local flora and fauna. And water is a huge issue in Southern California. So I've had to learn how to put in irrigation hoses. And all you gardeners out there, although uh, this is um, hard work, you know you love it. <laughs> so as I've planted my yard with native species, uh, the, the bugs have come back, glory to God. I've got butterflies and hummingbirds everywhere. Whereas when I bought this little plot of property and it was all planted for East London, we had turf from walled sidewalk and privet and white roses everywhere. It's like, hello, this is a desert down here. Um, I never saw one hummingbird. Um, now I've got dozens of them. Um, in my part of the country, rain barrels are an expression of environmental concern. So over COVID, my husband and I uh, ordered the kits from Wayfair.com and we put rain barrels in on every one of our downspouts. Um, my kids and I, we got chickens. Now, in the South, I know chickens are anathema. Um, they are uh, associated with white trash, if I'm allowed to say the word. But uh, here in Southern California, they're hip. And so Greta and Mags and Lucy are out there laying all the eggs we need and helping to eat our bugs and fertilize what's left of those white roses. Um, we save every baggie that goes in every lunchbox. I never throw away a bread bag. Um, I've got a whole drawer dedicated to this isn't winding up in the Atlantic. It's going to get used and used and used again. Um, I talk a lot about voting with your pocketbook. When you get to the grocery store, pay attention to what's on the label. Um, you'll learn from my book what the whole business about cage-free is. And once you find out, you're never gonna buy eggs the same way again. You're gonna find out what's happening with the pork industry and you're gonna start reading labels. Um, my husband now has PTSD about going to the grocery store because if he comes home with the wrong label, his wife is yelling at him. Um, so all of these things are things we can do that show our personal investment. Do I think I'm gonna win this war with my drawer full of reused Ziploc bags? Uh, no, probably not. But will I as a Christian be standing up and saying I care and not on my watch? Yeah, yeah, so just like I'm never gonna manage to feed every orphan in Darfur, um, yeah, 
but do I have two little girls from World Vision that we've helped raise? Yeah, I got two of them. Um, that's the posture I take. Uh, in the words of Christine Pohl, small moves against the darkness. Again, a long answer to a short question, but that's what we're up to. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for your um, scholarship and your enthusiasm for this and for sharing with us today. Uh, and, I, and I do recommend people pick this book up and you'll learn more about the Bible. I mean, you, you give a lot of history and interpretation mm -hmm. that is there. Uh, you'll learn more about the Bible as well as what it is to be a good steward of the earth that God has given us. So mm. thank you very much, Sandy. I appreciate you, your time today. You are so welcome. And Rick, I don't know, uh, could I close this down by reading a quotation here? Would that be all right? Yes, please. Um, this is coming from my conclusion. And in my research, I was reading a lot of um, and, uh, environmental scientists and activists reading their literature. And this quote comes from a guy named Gus Speth, who's been in the game for decades. He was the chairman of the Council of Environmental Quality under President Jimmy Carter. So he's the real McCoy on the scientist side. And of course, I'm approaching this as a biblical theologian, and you and I, we're talking to the church, right? Mm -hmm. um, my expertise is not in climate change. It's in Deuteronomy. But this is what Gus Speth, whose expertise is in the political arena of environmental thought, this is what he has to say at the end of his career. And Christians out there, I, I hope you hear this quote the way I did, because I heard this quote, and my first response was, put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. So here we go. Gus Speth, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity, loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and a spiritual transformation. And we scientists, we don't know how to do that. Yeah, we scientists don't know how to do that, but Christian leaders, pastors, Sunday school teachers, influential uh, members of the Board of Elders, regular everyday Christians, we know how to do that. And it's time for us to do that. Let's listen to the voice of our scriptures and respond as citizens of the kingdom of God. And let's show Gus Speth what a moral and religious reawakening can look like. Let's waken the sleeping giant and let's see what she can do. I'd like to thank Sandy Richter for giving us time to pick her brain about the environment and where we find that we are to be stewards of creation. There is another part of this interview that I invite you to look for as well. Uh, just do a search on Great Bible Teachers or on the YouTube channel that we have. Each week, you're invited to be part of these interviews, to listen to them, and also to read the blog article. To find out about these, you can sign up for our e-news. It is at greatbibleteachers.com and you'll get a newsletter that reminds you about the blog article coming out on Tuesdays. And then on Thursdays, you'll receive an email that lets you know about the interviewee and the subject of that day. So I invite you to sign up for the e-newsletter. Thank you again for joining us today.